Tony Blair, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I'm glad to be able to speak to you today to tell you that Saddam Hussein's regime is collapsing, that the years of brutality, oppression and fear are coming to an end. Light them all up. Light them all Come up. Come on, fire. Light them all up. They're right all up. Our enemy is Saddam and his regime, not the Iraqi people. Our forces are friends and liberators of the Iraqi people, not your conquerors. I know, however, that some of you feared a repeat of 1991, when you thought Saddam's rule was being ended, but he stayed and you suffered. That will not happen this time. This regime will be gone and ended. And then we will work with you to build the peaceful, prosperous Iraq that you want and that you deserve. So it is in the spirit of friendship and goodwill that we now offer our help. Thank you. I'm George Galloway. I spent decades in the Labour Party and in Parliament with Tony Blair. I also campaigned against his and Bush's wars alongside millions of people around the world. Since then, every prediction we made has played out tragically before our eyes. But one thing nobody predicted was the horror story yet to come, the Blair Rich Project. This film, crowdfunded by more than 5,000 people, seeks to set the record straight about Blair's near killing of the Labour Party, the killing of Iraq, and the huge financial killing he has made thereafter. This is the killings of Tony Blair. When Tony Blair resigned as Prime Minister in 2007, he wasted no time before stepping on to the lucrative public speaking circuit, where his statements of the bleeding obvious have been in high demand. The single toughest thing governments find today is getting the job done. At his first stop, Blair picked up a Chinese takeaway of almost a quarter of a million pounds for an hour-long speech in the People's Republic. The art of leadership is the combination of listening and leading. Since then, his fees have gone up and up, and his speeches have taken him across the globe. The most difficult thing about government is taking the great idea and turning it into reality. In the Philippines, the average wage for an hour's work is under a pound. Blair did rather better. Unfortunately, you come to India at a time when British papers like The Telegraph and The Sunday Telegraph, The Sunday Times, are running stories about what they call the jet-setting billionaire lifestyle he has enjoyed ever since leaving Downing Street in June 2007. And the real point they're making is that the pursuit of money has become the dominant theme in your life. I can make a lot more and have a very gentle and easy life. And when I talk about a jet-set lifestyle, what it actually means I spend a lot of time on jets, which is true. True indeed, so much so that Blair charters a 30 million pound private jet known as Blair Force One. But even more lucrative for Blair than public speaking is his global business empire, headquartered in London's wealthiest neighborhood, Mayfair. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. I'm George Galloway. I'm making a film about Tony Blair. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if uh, you're going to reply to the two letters I've delivered through your door seeking uh, an interview. Hello? 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 They hung up. What can I say? I was joined by Francis Beckett, who has investigated the consultancy firm Blair Operates from here. Tony Blair Associates is a very, very secretive operation that makes a very large amount of money all over the world from a large number of governments, some of them you might regard as less than respectable, some of them Middle Eastern governments, some of them former Soviet Union governments, and it also makes a large amount of money in consultancy fees from private companies. What they seem to take is the sort of advice that involves the consultant picking up a telephone and putting them in touch with the right world leader or the right business leader. So what he's doing really is living off the contacts book that he retired with as Prime Minister. You mentioned the scale of it. Mm. How many countries do you think Tony Blair is now working in? Well, there's at least 20. There could be more than 30, I, but I can, I can vouch for well over 20. Tony Blair, Inc., like the British Empire in its heyday, is so vast that upon it, the sun never sets. Well, my Irish grandfather used to say, that was because no one would trust the British in the dark. Blair's choice of clients doesn't exactly inspire trust either. The ruler of Kazakhstan, for instance. Tony Blair and Nazaltan Nazarbayev first met when Tony Blair was still prime minister. He became one of Blair's most loyal clients. Nazarbayev had something of an image problem. Despite often paying lip service to democracy, he is widely regarded as a dictator. After all, he has ruled Kazakhstan for a quarter of a century. Those who criticize the president face imprisonment, but his opponents are not always so lucky. Leaders of, of opposition and dissent are regularly murdered. They are, they are simply shot out of hand. The worst atrocity in Kazakhstan in the last few years has been when the government shot about 60 striking miners. Many hoped the autocrat's new courtier would condemn the massacre. Instead, Blair was soon starring in a Kazakh propaganda film. The important thing about President Azerbaijan is that I think he had a combination of the, the toughness necessary to take the decisions to put the country on the right path, um, but also I think a certain degree of um, subtlety and ingenuity that allowed him to manoeuvre in a region which is fraught with difficulties. Blair was sustained by a coal mining district throughout his parliamentary career and now uh, he's taking massive checks from somebody who shoots miners if they go on strike. Media reports put Blair's fee at 16 million pounds over two years. But what was this king's ransom for? Good governance, as Blair claimed? A leaked letter he sent Nazarbayev suggests otherwise. In it, Blair provides a phrase to help the dictator spin his massacre for a Western audience. These events, tragic though they were, should not obscure the enormous progress that Kazakhstan has made. He continues, dealing with it in the way I suggest is the best way for the Western media. Signed, with very best wishes, I look forward to seeing you in London. Yours ever, Tony Blair. 
Fresh from his Kazakh snow job for Nazarbayev, Blair was soon showering praise on another dictator. Egypt's General Sisi had just seized power in a military coup. Blair himself explicitly praised not only the Sisi dictatorship in, in Egypt, but the overthrow of the elected government in Egypt, which he described as the rescue of a nation. Now, this is a coup. The minimum estimate is that 2,000 people were killed on the streets of Egyptian cities in that coup d'etat. 20,000 people were arrested and held without trial. There have been a 1,000 death sentences handed out by this regime, which by any reckoning is one of the more brutal dictatorships in the region. And this guy, Sisi, is the one that Blair is openly championing. For the first time in my memory, you have a leadership in Egypt that understands the modern world, is prepared to take the measures that are relevant to the modern world, and wants Egypt connected to the modern world in the right way. And that is a fantastic opportunity. You shouldn't need rules to tell an ex-prime minister he shouldn't do these things. You really shouldn't need rules. It should be self-evident in your ethical standing that you should not do this sort of thing. What does it do for the ongoing reputation of Britain if, you know, if somebody hawks himself around essentially as an influence agent? There's an honour about being Prime Minister of Britain and a dignity about being a former Prime Minister of Britain. Mr Blair is using that dignity to go around the world advising torturers, dictators, murderers, in return for hard cash. No previous Labour Prime Minister in the whole history of the Labour Party has behaved in this shameful, money-grubbing way. Dawn has broken, has it not? In 1997, a fresh-faced Tony Blair embodied the hopes of a nation as his landslide victory ended 18 years of conservative rule. 97 was an extraordinary year. Was wonderful pictures of that sunny day when uh, Tony and Cherie processed along Downing Street with screaming crowds. We were happy for the country to end the years of Thatcherism and even though he wasn't my party, I welcomed his, uh, his uh, election to Labour leader and I thought this was an opportunity for a new direction in British politics. As I stand here before number 10 Downing Street, I know... The huge responsibility that is upon me and the great trust that the British people have placed in me. We were all convinced that Blair would find a way of reconciling the divisions in Britain and making us a sort of more honourable and less cynical country. And it will be a government that seeks to restore trust in politics in this country. It's undeniable, even for me, that Blair's easygoing charm had mass appeal. But then, once you can fake the sincerity, the rest is easy. My dad saying, God, she's married this middle-class Tory type. And he was kind of disturbed about that. But I know he quickly grew to, to love Tony because of the love that Tony and Cherie had. What kind of impact did he make on you? I adored him. Quite, quite simply, as an older brother, I thought he was, uh, you know, the bee's knees, basically. Tony was the kind of a young lawyer who'd wear the shirt without ironing it, and his wife would shout him, will you change that shirt? You know, on the right side of cool, kind of older brother figure. 
George, I think he could even charm you. He could. If he walked in here now, I know you don't like to hear this, but I reckon Tony could sit here and go, George, you know I've always admired you, and I'm telling you your heart would flutter. What do you think? Maybe, but I would then arrest him, <laughs> uh, which would be the end of the fluttering. He made a terrific impression on me. He was extremely, he had that Clinton thing, you know, that he looked into your eyes and his eyes were round and big and smiley. And, and he was very charming. He was a real pro, yeah? He was a total pro. And, you know, he'd been a lawyer, he liked his cricket, he liked his uh, football. He had all the charm of manner that could make one think, well, this is really, this is gonna be something. He became this incredible pop idol kind of prime minister. Mm. And the first one that we'd had. With his award, here is the foot tapping, pop loving, he's got nice hair, Tony Blair. Married life, actually. Did you? Funny thing, oh, yes. you have to say about well, life? well, me and Tony both reckon it was rubbish. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but many of us in the Labour Party didn't buy into Blair mania. For us, the party had been hijacked and was being flown to destruction. Because we'd seen Blair stab his best friend in the back to become Labour leader, and then hack off the party's commitment to socialism. Most deadly of all was Blair's dance with one of Labour's worst enemies and one of the world's most powerful men. You do like the feeling of power you have as a newspaper proprietor of being able to sort of formulate policies for a large number of newspapers in every state of Australia. Well, there's only one honest answer that, of course, and that's yes. Rupert Murdoch's news empire spanned over 150 newspapers across four continents, including a third of Britain's newspaper market. His papers had always backed the Tories, and the Tories had always won. But with Labour on course for victory in 97, Murdoch was worried about the party's plans to loosen his grip on the press. But he wouldn't worry for long. Tony Blair, who had an unerring instinct for where power lay in society, and understood that in this era, it was very important to bring the media on side and offer them a deal. Two years before becoming prime minister, Blair went halfway around the world to attend a Murdoch conference in Hayman Island, off the coast of Australia, to pay tribute at the court of the Sun King. It should have been called Hyman Island, I was thinking, looking at the name today, because he went there and yielded himself to, and gave his media virginity to Mr Murdoch. Blair just sent this sign right away, you know, we're yours if you, you, know, you want us, tell us what to do. In his conference speech, Blair said he opposed new laws to limit how much of the media could be owned by one person. In other words, he opposed his own policy. He went to make a very clear deal. I will look after your interests if you call off your dogs and if you back me. Sure enough, by election time in 1997, all of Murdoch's papers backed Blair to the hilt. Once in power, Blair returned the favor, protecting the Murdoch empire from any new media legislation. How would you describe your relationship with Tony Blair? I'm a supporter. New Labour was backed in power by the most powerful media interests, the most powerful corporations and city interests, because they realised he was representing them. You sup with the devil, you, you take a long spoon, is the rule, isn't it? And I don't think there's any doubt that as far as British polity is concerned, Rupert Murdoch was the devil in, in, in that. To come to an accommodation with him meant sacrificing all the principles the Labour Party stood for. The Labour Party I had joined as a 13-year-old was, as it says on the tin, a party of the working class. It prided itself on its internal democracy, with members having the right to vote on policy. 
but under the banner of what they called New Labour and I called Non-Labour, Blair and his clique began to steer the party into the eager embrace of Thatcherism, dragging a left-wing party into the footsteps of the Iron Lady would require an iron fist. For Blair, democracy was so overrated. What we see developing very early in the Blair administration is the kind of tactics that one associates with emperors or uh, rulers of one sort or another who are non-democratic. -de they sort of just had a party in which dissent really wasn't tolerated. No decisions were made in, in the cabinet. It didn't operate as a cabinet in the way that constitutional theory says it should. People would turn up and it was a sort of little chat. If there was ever anything coming up that he thought you might want to argue about, he'd ask to see you beforehand and try and iron it out. He didn't want any clashing or discussion of ideas and a, a kind of collective thrashing out of a line. I mean, that it, it just didn't happen. Blair had this presidential manner. He ruled by, you know, sofa politics. He, you picture him and Alistair Campbell leaning back and sort of, you know, feet up on the desk deciding the fate of the nation. The appointment of Alistair Campbell was an acceptance of the brutality and bullying culture that is endemic in Westminster. You know, if Tony didn't want to see you and if you were shown in to see Alistair Campbell, you were going to get a rollicking. You going to get monsters. You were going to get yeah. monsters. Campbell was there with Blair, and he was like the hard guy. Tony was Mr. Charm. Campbell could be rude and rough and swear, and so they were like a duo, Mr. Tough and Mr. Nice, but shoulder to shoulder. Not only were, uh, were Mandelson and Campbell the, the pillars who supported Blair, and did all his enforcing and his fixing, but they were often used as lightning rods. Yes. When things happened, when it was clearly Blair had, had done something appalling or wrong or stupid, they would step forward and take all the lightning for mm. him mm. and protect him. He was very well protected. Surrounded by sycophants and slippery by nature, Blair soon earned the nickname Teflon Tony, because dirt never stuck to him. There is a remarkable quote in Chris Mullins uh, diary of Blair giving advice to David Miliband about how to conduct himself in public office. He says, smile at everybody and get somebody else to stab their back. be tough on sleaze and tough on the causes of sleaze. Less than six months after becoming Prime Minister, Blair was caught up in a corruption scandal that would have ended most politicians' careers. His government had announced plans to ban tobacco advertising from sport. But what we didn't know was that before coming to power, he had accepted a £1 million donation from Bernie Ecclestone, owner of Formula One. Ecclestone then secretly visited Blair in Downing Street as the decision was being made. Do you, do you give a donation expecting something in return? No, nope. I didn't want anything. I still don't want anything to be honest with Within hours of the meeting, Blair had ordered his minions to grant Formula One a special exemption from the ban. His health secretary protested, saying the U-turn would result in serious damage to the government. Blair simply overruled him, and Bernie Ecclestone's Formula One continued to peddle tobacco. The Eccleston affair should have been the moment that we in the press and indeed the nation saw through Mr. Blair. He was caught red-handed trading policy in return for hard cash from a businessman. Blair's backroom bullying remained secret for another decade, allowing our new prime minister to wriggle free from the scandal, 
with this priceless apology to the nation. I would never do anything either to harm the country or anything proper. I never have. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. Just as people hoped for an end to Tory sleaze under New Labour, they also hoped Britain would play a decent role in the world. The Labour government does not accept that political values can be left behind when we check in our passports to travel and diplomatic business. Our foreign policy must have an ethical dimension. Whatever his party wanted, when it came to hawking weapons around the world, Blair took his cue from Mrs. Thatcher. Aircraft are very expensive these days, and so you don't want them to have just one role when that one role is advanced training. So they also are being adapted for a strike capacity, a ground strike capacity, which is why you've got these on. So they're very good, not only for advanced training, but for striking. From day one, Blair cozied up to Britain's biggest weapons dealer, BAE Systems, and its chief executive, Dick Evans. A year into government, Blair yet again overruled his cabinet to rubber stamp BAE's sale of Hawk jets to Indonesia's dictatorship, which was ethnically cleansing thousands in East Timor. This was Blair sending out a plain message saying, you can say what you want about ethical foreign policy, but I'm in charge of this government. Yes. And you know, if we want to sell planes to dictators to bomb their civilian populations, we're going to do so. The state of Africa is a scar on the conscience of the world. That was almost Oscar worthy because even as he uttered those words, privately, Blair was persuading one of the poorest countries in Africa, Tanzania, to spend 28 million pounds on BAE's military air traffic control system. Tanzania had no operational air force. Smelling corruption, one of Blair's ministers confronted her boss. In the case of Tanzania, it couldn't afford this, and, and I was planning some tens of millions aid to pay for a big move to universal primary education. So if they went ahead with it, we were going to use British aid that, in effect to pay for this wretched, old-fashioned, useless air traffic control system, and I thought there must be corruption here. So it was a disgusting, disgraceful project, and Tony thought I was making a fuss about nothing. But Blair was about to help BAE in a much bigger way, and not only them. The company had long been accused of corruption around the huge arms contract they signed with Saudi Arabia under Mrs. Thatcher. Called Al Yamama, the deal was worth over $40 billion. Dick Evans, at the time, BAE's man in Saudi Arabia, had gone as far as eating sheep's eyeballs to drive the deal through. Those of us who have examined Al Yamama are fond of remembering the, the phrase that was, you know, bruited about at the time the deal was cut, you know, the, the, the biggest sale of anything by anyone to anybody ever. I mean, we are talking amazingly large amounts of money here. It's a matter of public record that there were vast amounts of sweeteners involved in this deal. A close family friend of George W. Bush, the Saudi Prince Bandar alone was accused of trousering $2 billion. Blair blocked the publication of a parliamentary report on the deal, but the serious fraud office uncovered damning evidence that could wreck BAE and reveal the Saudi royal family as little more than 40,000 thieves. At the heart of BAE's bribery web, the investigators discovered a shell company based around the corner from the Saudi embassy in London. Its purpose was to pay for anything the Saudis wanted, from gambling trips 
to prostitutes. The payments continued on Blair's watch. By 2006, there was enough evidence for a prosecution against BAE and its chief executive, Big Dick Evans. The Serious Fraud Office had started an investigation into that slush fund, and Prince Bandar, of course, went into Tony Blair's office and asked him to shut down that investigation. So what did Tony Blair do? He acquiesced. There was clear corruption. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. And he just stops the inquiry and uses the national interest, you know, card to, to stop it all. Were you aware that your government was approving payments to a friend of President Bush's as part of uh, British Aerospace's kickback system? And is that why you suspended a fraud inquiry? <laughs> I'll do Glad it. you're answering that question. <laughs> a um, of mine. One of the worst things Blair did, which may not seem as terrible as his killing of, you know, uh, his actions result in the death of a million people in Iraq, uh, but the long-term effects could be even worse of his deciding that the, the executive, the prime minister, could stop a prosecution of, of BAE because it's not in the national interest or the security interest of the state to prosecute, which absolutely wipes out the rule of law. I don't believe the investigation is then it would have led anywhere except to the complete wreckage of a vital strategic relationship for our country in terms of fighting terrorism, in terms of the Middle East, in terms of British interests there. That was Blair's take. This was Bandar's. If you tell me that building this whole country and spending 350 billion out of 400 billion, that we had a misused or get corrupted with 50 billion, I'll tell you yes, but I'll take that any time. What I'm trying to tell you is, so what? Despite the stench of corruption under New Labour, it would be unfair to dismiss its record entirely. There were some achievements. A national minimum wage was introduced for the first time. Child poverty in the UK was cut significantly. And Blair's finest hour was brokering peace in the north of Ireland, ending decades of conflict. Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education, and education. Education and healthcare did receive much needed investment, but there was a catch. Under New Labour's private finance initiative, corporations were invited to build and run schools and hospitals for the first time. PFI was privatization by stealth and robbery by daylight. According to the Financial Times, these projects cost taxpayers up to £25 billion more than if they'd been government funded. PFI schools and hospitals slipped into an endless spiral of debt. But debts for some mean profits for others. Under New Labour, big business bloomed in the city of London because of the effective absence of regulation. Foreign banks were falling over themselves to get business into London because it wouldn't be as tightly regulated as it would elsewhere. The government effectively decided that for the wealthiest and for the biggest business, the tax regime would be almost voluntary. In a speech at a Goldman Sachs soiree, Blair even boasted how every high roller in the room was paying less tax under him than they had under Margaret Thatcher. When Mrs. Thatcher was asked to name her greatest legacy, her response was immediate. Tony Blair, a new Labour. It's long been my thesis that Tony Blair set out to kill the Labour Party by cutting it adrift from its roots and selling its soul to the banksters and big business. But the impact of the Blair era on British politics runs even deeper. By continuing Margaret Thatcher's legacy of privatization, Blair accelerated a form of corruption previously rare in Britain, the revolving door. He absolutely exemplifies a completely revolving door between the higher levels of the British civil service and private enterprise. 
and particularly forms of private enterprise that profit from conflict. And when he left office, Blair wasted no time before going through the very same revolving door to join the real wolf of Wall Street, J.P. Morgan Chase. According to Blair, his $5 million a year is for advice on, quote, the huge political and economic changes that globalization brings. Like J.P. Morgan didn't know that already. To find out what he's really up to, I met with someone who's worked on the inside. What he would have been expected to do is very different from the press release, which is just he's going to advise them and give them information about what's going on on a geopolitical global basis. The reality is banks are about making money. And having a former celebrity type of a prime minister gave them access to use the relationships with leaders so if Tony Blair has relationships in the Middle East, if Tony Blair has relationships with any European countries, the fact is that J.P. Morgan Chase would want it to be translated into deals. And deals bring commission, as Blair no doubt appreciated after the 30 billion pound corporate merger he brokered just around the corner from his Mayfair office. Francis Beckett walked me through the deal. He was brought in at the request of his client, J.P. Morgan, to grease the wheels for a merger between Extrata and Glencore, two very large companies. There were one or two little obstacles in the way, and Tony Blair was asked to sort it out. So he walked from his office to here, which, as you've just seen, George, is probably less than two minutes' walk. He spent a couple of hours in there. He was paid a million dollars for it. It's nice work if you can get it. Two or three hours' work. Not bad at In all. the comfort of Claridge's. Beats being at the coal face. It does indeed. As Blair's million-dollar payoff was only leaked by chance, it's anyone's guess how many such deals Blair has brokered. Besides J.P. Morgan, Blair also landed a job for Petro Saudi, an oil company owned by one of Prince Bandar's many cousins. Blair is popular at the court of the head choppers for obvious reasons. And it pays dividends. All these relationships that he's built up in the years since he was prime minister are, in most people's estimation, corrupt relationships they are clearly indicating that the decisions that Blair took when he was prime minister uh, had a direct imp impact on who paid him money thereafter. And of course, it's impossible to believe that that didn't affect the decision making in the first place. And that idea that people take decisions with the knowledge that they are going to be lavishly rewarded in the years to come is a knife at the heart of our political and democratic systems. Blair certainly has been lavishly rewarded, although estimates of his wealth differ wildly. I mean, I, I read them, so it's worth £100 million. Pounds. <laughs> Cherie's kind of asking where it is in that case. <laughs> uh... So how much is he really worth? With 31 UK homes, the Blair's property portfolio alone accounts for £25 million. Pounds. In search of an answer, to the multi-million dollar question, I joined financial journalist Richard Brooks outside Blair's country estate. He set up uh, a, a very complicated corporate structure to conceal the income that he's getting. There's a limited partnership called Windrush Ventures Number no. 3 Limited Partnership. Now, it's owned by something called Windrush Ventures Number no. 2 limited liability partnership, and it, 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 it 
in turn is owned by two companies, one called Windrush Ventures. All this jargon left me more confused than I was to begin with. And that's precisely the point. A loophole in the law allows him not to publish accounts of the limited partnership. So his income is completely secret. I am staggered by Blair's avarice since he has left office. I simply cannot get my head around it. Blair is clearly enchanted by money. But how did he fall under that spell? As a child, his family sent him to Fetis College, an elite school they struggled to afford. In this kind of Hogwarts castle, Tony Blair learned to rub shoulders with the big boys, the boys who would go on to run much of this country. But he also learned the lesson that he'd only feel truly secure when he had just as much money as them. But when his father had a stroke and was unable to work, Blair was alarmed by the modesty of his background compared with his chums. That obviously was probably the most important event of my childhood. I mean, I did learn through that that not everything in life was just a sort of smooth run, and it obviously brought with it tremendous insecurity. In his wife, Cherie, Blair found a kindred spirit. I knew her when she was a campaigning socialist. Now she's a highly paid lawyer and businesswoman. But she still felt the need to sell Tony's autograph on eBay for a tenner a time. But the money grubbing matters, because since becoming a multi-millionaire, Blair has also become one of Britain's biggest benefit claimants. First, there's the more than £100,000 he claims as a former prime minister to run his private office. And then there's his security detail, costing taxpayers up to £16,000 a week. Eight police officers accompany Blair as he crisscrosses the globe, while others guard his houses. He is unable to walk down a street in Britain without heavy, heavy police protection. His house here in London is guarded by members of the Metropolitan Tactical Firearms Support Unit 24-7. I mean, the idea that the, the public purse is funding Blair's security to run what are, in fact, commercial operations around the world is an outrage. But he needs an armed guard for a reason. He was then paid six million dollars every year and still is from JP Morgan six months after he left office. The man is a war criminal! War criminal! Tony Blair! War criminal! Tony Blair! Tony Blair's legacy is absolutely clear. He will always be remembered as the man who took us into an illegal and unnecessary war. The two million march which ended here in Hyde Park on February 15, 2003 was the biggest in British history by many times over. Tony Blair's decision to defy the millions has, of course, defined his political legacy. As for me, as one of the leaders of that march, well, Tony Blair had me expelled from the Labour Party. Of course, I would have opposed the war in any case, but Iraq was special. In the 1980s, led by the late Tony Benn, I'd been one of those Labour MPs opposing Britain arming Saddam Hussein in the first place. In the 1990s, I took a London bus from Big Ben to Baghdad to oppose the West's sanctions on Iraq, which killed a half a million children. Sir, pleased to meet you. When the American war drums began beating, we feared the worst, because by then we knew that our own prime minister had developed his own taste for regime change. 
Even before Iraq, Blair had led us into four wars, more than any other prime minister. Blair's foreign policy championed the right of the West to police a simplified world of good and evil. It goes without saying that our allies were the goodies. In 1999, Serbia, a Western enemy, was suppressing an armed uprising in its Kosovo region. To stop one massacre, Blair convinced Clinton to launch another. It is a just cause, and it is a cause that we will succeed in winning. The attack broke international law, escalating the killing on both sides. But the media hailed it a success, and Blair its hero. Going to Kosovo is possibly the key moment when he's walking through that camp and people are kind of treating him like, like Jesus, really. Almost on their knees praying to him. All these babies have been named after him. Tony. Yeah, yeah, cheering his name. Now, to somebody with a latent and incipient messianic tendency, it's like somebody who, you know, has like soft drugs, suddenly you give them heroin and one hit and you're hurt, if he wasn't already. But if you are, it's going to exacerbate the addiction. We will do whatever we can to make sure that these people are allowed by the world community, acting together, back to their homeland, back to Kosovo. Kosovo catapulted Blair into the big league of global power players. But it also taught him an important lesson. If you're on the winning side, you're above the law you can get away with murder. Blair's inner crusader was soon to be challenged by an event of biblical proportions. This is a moment to seize. The kaleidoscope has been shaken. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think he suddenly saw himself as some sort of warrior in the self-styled war on terror. This is a battle with only one outcome, our victory, not theirs. He changed and became, I'm going to show I'm tough and powerful and important and significant on the world stage. I'll do that by being best friends with the President of the United States. Blair needed a dose of sanity, but W definitely wasn't the guy to provide it. <laughs> Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. And I give you on behalf of our country our solidarity, our sympathy, and our support. The special relationship means England is our lieutenant. The fashionable word is partner. Thank you. We gotta go. That's the Thank word they like to hear. Tony Blair seemed to always be at our president's side, nodding his head and, and agreeing with um, whatever policy it was. And, and I believe he was even called George Bush's poodle for that reason. Wouldn't have matter who was in the White House. Mm. It could have been Big Bird from Sesame Street or the late <laughs> Stanley Matthews or, you know, or a Martian. It doesn't matter who was in the White House. The personnel are irrelevant. The thing is, it is the White House. America has no truer friend than Great Britain. By the time he goes to Congress for that joint address by Bush to both houses of Congress, and he's sitting up there among yeah. the senators and representatives, he's given standing ovations. And this is the global citadel of pure power. The American president 
is bringing about standing ovations for you. There is no bigger stage in the world than that. Blair took his seat at the heart of American empire and was ready to follow Bush's crusade to the ends of the earth. First stop, Afghanistan, in search of Osama bin Laden. But instead of just smoking their bogeyman out of his cave, they bombarded, occupied, ultimately destroyed one of the world's poorest countries. In truth, bin Laden was a sideshow. Afghanistan, a springboard for a much more ambitious plan for the region. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11. Officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. I walked out of there pretty upset. And then we attacked Afghanistan. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. So why this interest in dominating the Middle East? And why was Iraq at the top of the list? I think it was primarily for oil. Not just the oil of Iraq, but uh, establishing a base in the, at the heart of the main energy producing region of the world. The fact that many in the Bush administration stood to profit from Iraq's oil, no doubt, helped too. The policy was regime change, a crime under international law. To get the ball rolling, W invited Blair to his ranch in Texas, where they were alone together for several hours. Some say they got down on their knees and prayed. If two people want to pray in private, that's their own business. Good luck to them. If they are praying to receive instructions from the Almighty about destroying our country and causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, then I think we start to have our problem. There were four big political figures around the world, global figures at the time. Blair, Bush, Osama bin Laden and Saddam. And of the four of them, the only one who wasn't a religious maniac was Saddam. When they left the ranch, Bush and Blair were singing from the same hymn sheet. We both recognize the danger of Saddam Hussein harboring and developing weapons of mass destruction. The president is right to draw attention to the threat of weapons of mass destruction. That threat is real. As minutes of a Bush-Blair meeting spell out, the war was to be justified by imaginary threats, Iraqi terrorism, and weapons of mass destruction, the intelligence to be fixed around the policy. As Blair toured the world drumming up support for the war, the Americans had discovered the only real WMD around, a weapon of mass deception. Blair's strong, uh, passionate, often uh, advocacy of the war carried a lot of weight. That evidence of weapons of mass destruction is evidence, the truth of which I have absolutely no doubt about at all. Without Blair's vocal support and participation, they might not have been able to carry it off. I think he facilitated it. I think he was very eloquent, uh, even much more eloquent, of course, th than um, our president. But Blair knew his toughest sell would be at home. The Iraqi regime has weapons of mass destruction. We know that. Weapons of mass destruction. Chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. I don't think anybody in the British Foreign Office believed Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. I met Sir William Patey, who at the time was head of the Middle East Department. And I stopped Bill in the corridor and I said, Bill, what, what's all this about WMD? It's not true, is it? And he said, of course not, it's bollocks. And that was precisely the time that Blair makes his claim. 
With the letters WMD now etched onto the public imagination, Blair and his spin doctor, Alastair Campbell, cobbled together a dossier of so-called intelligence to crank up the fear of Saddam. He has existing and active military plans for the use of chemical and biological weapons, which could be activated within 45 minutes. Tony Blair was implying that Iraq could launch an attack using weapons of mass destruction within 45 minutes against the British Isles. Now, I've been to pretty much all chemical facilities in Iraq. I oversaw the inspections of a huge number. I just don't think there was any evidence to support that they could launch anything within 45 minutes. The UN inspectors were there and they were finding nothing. So why lie about it, continue to lie, if you had not uh, ulterior motives to go into war regardless? And that was the truth. This danger is present and real and with us now, and its potential is huge. As the rhetoric heated up, the media coverage heated up, and the poll results followed along. People really became frightened. Saddam Hussein is a threat to America. He's a threat to our friends. He's a man who said he wouldn't have weapons of mass destruction, yet he has them. He is a man who would likely team up with Al-Qaeda. Well, that proved a lie. Saddam and Al-Qaeda were enemies, every Iraqi knew. It was common knowledge that Al-Qaeda were opponents of, uh, of Saddam. My office was certainly placed under political pressure in this politicized effort to go to war um, on these pretexts of a link between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, which was, of course, fiction. When the propaganda machine is, is full blast, it is a sight to behold, in a way. The lies became so frantic that, wow, even a child would know who Saddam is, where Iraq is and why it should be invaded. This is not the time to falter. This is the time for this House, not just this government or indeed this Prime Minister, but for this House to give a lead, to show that we will stand up for what we know to be right to show that we will confront the tyrannies and dictatorships and terrorists who put our way of life at risk. Yeah. To show at the moment of decision that we have the courage to do the right thing, I beg to move the motion. Yeah. On the brink of war, the anti-war movement became a tidal wave of opposition around the world. Both Bush as well as Tony Blair are now wanting to plunge the world into a holocaust. And I'm happy that the people of the world are standing up and opposing. I say to Mr. Blair, the British people have voted with their feet, and their vote is no war on Iraq. Personal statement, Robin Cook. I cannot support a war without international agreement or domestic support. It is for that reason, and that reason alone, and with a heavy heart, that I have resigned from the government. Yeah. Cries of millions were ignored. Bush and Blair were on a mission, and nothing was going to stop them. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land, and sea to remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. Just imagine being shock a child and, and shock and or imagine being a child in Baghdad, listening to that, that incredible, terrifying noise. I would term it to be state terrorism. 
of the First Order, in fact, terrified the Iraqi population of Baghdad. They refused to count the dead. That is to their shame to the end of time. With Baghdad crushed in a matter of weeks, Bush and Blair boasted of their success. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed, and Iraq is free. The triumphalism was amplified by a faithful media. He said that they would be able to take Baghdad without a bloodbath. He has been proved conclusively right, and it would be entirely ungracious, uh, even for his critics, not to acknowledge that tonight he stands as a larger man and a stronger prime minister as a result. More credible commentators took a different view. It is not in conformity with the UN charter from our point of view and from the charter point of view, it was illegal. The fall of Baghdad was not the beginning of the end, but merely the end of the beginning. The Iraqi people bitterly resisted their invaders, and so-called liberation became brutal occupation. Then, in the cruelest of ironies, the invaders unleashed on Iraq the very thing they supposedly invaded the country to prevent, chemical warfare. They used phosphorus. With white phosphorus, once it touches the skin, it eats into it to the bone. Depleted uranium, contaminated sometimes with plutonium, also being used. Now that comes well within the definition of a war crime. Depleted uranium was used across Iraq. Poisoning the land, poisoning the waters, silently killing people. And the rates of cancer have risen enormously. War brutalizes people. And unfortunately, some British soldiers also practice brutality, mistreating prisoners, torturing them in captivity, killing some of them under torture. Something dark went on, something very dark went on. For all the brutality of the occupation, the Iraqi resistance refused to lie down. To break it, the invaders used the oldest trick in the colonizer's book, divide and rule. Sectarianism was incubated and deliberately fostered by the occupation forces from the first day. Power was divided up between the sects and between the ethnic groups. They also played a role in deliberately supporting both sectarian camps against each other to weaken resistance to the occupation. Sunni was pitted against Shia, and Iraq descended into a sectarian bloodbath. The Lancet, one of the world's most prestigious medical journals, put the Iraqi death toll at 655,000 as of 2006. Bush and Blair rubbished the report, but later estimates were even higher. I think a million and more 
were killed. They want to lower the figures so that history doesn't judge them because they keep saying Saddam would have killed more had he stayed in power. Well, all the people he killed do not come to that sort of horrific uh, total. Nowhere near it. The U.S. and Britain uh, unilaterally carried out the worst crime of the 21st century. I am no uh, supporter of dictators of any sort around the world, but the people of Iraq today have a worse life than they had under Saddam Hussein. It is plainly not as good today as it was before. Going to war illegally should have brought down the British government, I would have thought, and certainly terminated Mr. Blair's career. Is Tony Blair a war criminal? In my opinion, yes. Most definitely. If Tony Blair isn't a war criminal, who is? There can be no such thing as a war criminal if Tony Blair is not one, having started an illegal war of aggression. Having ignited a fire in the Middle East that might never go out, Blair stepped down as Prime Minister. But even the most cynical among us couldn't have predicted his next role. As you know, as I'm, I'm the Middle East peace uh, envoy out in, in the Middle East trying to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue. What a joke. What a, what, a, what a... beyond a joke. What an insult. My job is to, to try to get agreement between Israelis and Palestinians for the quartet which tries to get agreement between the United States, the United Nations, the European Union and Russia. I thought after being Prime Minister of Britain for 10 years, I should try something easy. It does have the flavour of a purely satirical mm. gesture. <laughs> I think he's the person least suitable for that kind of job. This is a man who created war to ask him to a struggle for peace is absurd. Good morning. At the time, I described Blair's appointment as the most grotesque since the Emperor Caligula appointed his horse a proconsul of Rome. But others disagreed. On top of Blair's peacemaking successes in the north of Ireland, there were signs that he was seeking redemption. After all, he had set up several charitable foundations. He had even converted to Catholicism. But when we found out who was behind his appointment, all hope of atonement quickly evaporated. <coughs> <laughs> this was a favour from his old mucker, George W. Bush, to give Blair a role on the world stage on day one after leaving office. But that, of course, he pays a price for that, because he, ever since then, Mr. Blair has been the American point man in the quartet. So delighted to see you here. I can only assume that the Americans and the Israeli government viewed him as a safe pair of hands. Uh, in other words, they were confident that he would do nothing. Israel's brutal domination of Palestinians in the illegally occupied territories worsened significantly during Blair's tenure as peace envoy. Fatalities rose sevenfold, from 373 in 2007 to 2,300 in the year he left office. As we speak, while you and I are talking, George, Israel is pounding Gaza, um, having pounded the West Bank earlier, and is um, in, a, in a way that is, as a Jew, I find deeply upsetting. It was a greater mood of optimism, actually, at the meeting today than I've seen for several years. The way in which Mr. Blair has conducted himself in that office uh, makes one want to cry. 
the whole concept of the quartet was a sideshow. It was put there simply to keep everybody quiet while the usual business of doing nothing continued. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The quartet, more than anything else, is an international umbrella giving immunity to criminal policies on a daily basis. It's such an abomination. Things become even worse with military invasion. Then the soldiers do what they want at will. They can destroy your house, they can demolish your shop, they can arrest you. You are not immune whether you are an old lady, a child, a toddler. In many respects, the Middle East region should regard Israel not as an enemy, but as a model. Without American weapons and money, Israeli aggression would have to stop, and a peaceful settlement might be possible. The quartet eventually became just a, a place where people meet once every six to nine months uh, to say something that doesn't anger the Palestinians, doesn't anger the Israelis, and doesn't anger anybody. So it's become utterly useless. Very early on, he named six projects that should be done. One of them was about sanitation in Gaza, which is a very, very serious crisis. Even that isn't done. So what is he doing? One thing Blair did accomplish was a lucrative telecoms deal. It's a $700 million investment over the next few years. It'll bring in revenues to the Palestinian Authority, about $300 million a year, so it's really, really important for the Palestinian Authority. He said that he was on behalf of the Palestinians, but the fact is that, that one of the major bankers to that deal was his own bank, J.P. Morgan, something which was not disclosed at all at the time. Tony Blair has very serious conflict of interest in which he is doing business during the term of his official duties. In eight years as peace envoy, Blair has visited the Middle East around 120 times. He visited Gaza just twice. It's a grave disappointment for this man to turn out an opportunist in a cause that uh, does not allow any more profiteering and uh, making use of our tragedy. Another contact from his prime ministerial days proved very rewarding to our globe-trotting peace envoy. People thought that he was going as a representative of the quartet to discuss Middle East peace with the Emir of Kuwait. Uh, there was a, a clue, however, in the fact that he didn't take with him anybody from the rather well-staffed office of the quartet in Jerusalem, but instead he took with him the senior consultant for Tony Blair Associates, Jonathan Powell the former chief of staff in Downing Street. This is an extraordinary confusion of roles. Blair is going there on behalf of the world to seek Middle Eastern peace, but he's piggybacking on that role to pursue personal financial gain in the shape of Tony Blair Associates. The alleged fee always seemed rather a lot for Blair's customary advice on economic reform. Well, the figure that I heard was £27 million, um, and, uh, I mean, that figure has never been convincingly argued with. I, I think Tony Blair has said the figure is wrong, but, as usual, he doesn't offer us an alternative figure. Basically, the Emir of Kuwait was boundlessly grateful to Mr Blair for his role in the invasion of Iraq and the toppling of Saddam Hussein. Certainly, the Emir of Kuwait feels uh, a certain sentimental attachment to Tony Blair because of the Iraq War. To him, Tony Blair was the man who rescued his regime and his country. 
And it may well be that he feels that if he is going to hire a consultancy firm, he should at the same time show his gratitude to Tony Blair. I have no idea whether that's the case or not. But it certainly doesn't seem a particularly good way to spend £27 million. But it was his relationship with a rather better-known Arab dictator that started to eat away at the remains of Blair's credibility. I'm sure a lot of the relationship that Blair was very keen to build with Gaddafi was financially motivated. The Libyan uh, sort of sovereign fund before the fall of Gaddafi uh, was incredibly attractive to international bankers. They circled around it like bees round a honeypot. He can go into a place like Libya and he can open the door to an $80 billion sovereign wealth fund and uh, let JP Morgan swoop in and snatch and grab. And there was huge commission huge commission for whoever could get hold of a portion of it and then get it to their bank. You've got to ask the question, was he, at least in part, on these missions to Libya out to try and land himself that personal commission? When Gaddafi was overthrown, half a billion of his dollars were stashed at JP Morgan. But Gaddafi had made demands of Blair too. The colonel's sponsorship of a French airline bombing in the 1980s now landed him a massive compensation bill from victims' families. They demanded about, I think, a sum of $1.5 billion as recompense to the families of the Americans who died in that attack. And it seems that Gaddafi put the squeeze on Blair to go and intercede with his old buddy, George Bush, to get this dropped. At the end of his presidency, Bush passed a law preventing future compensation claims against Gaddafi. It's extraordinary that Mr. Blair was lobbying George W. Bush on behalf of Colonel Gaddafi, all the more so because his lobbying had implications for British victims. Given that Mr. Blair had commercial interests in Libya, the affair is very difficult to explain in a honorable way. But even worse was the discovery of documents indicating a blood-stained backstory to his waltz with Gaddafi. Extraordinary rendition. And that's the legal term for what we as governments do. When we take a person against his or her will and we take them from one country to another without any legal process, it's called kidnapping. The Mafia does a lot of it, so do the governments, unfortunately. It's a process in which people are abducted, smuggled, taken in aircraft and ships to another country, while, of course, they're subjected to certain methods of questioning, which, again, is not subject to due process because, again, it gets in the way. It's much quicker just to beat it out of you. Libyan dissident Abdul Hakim Belhaj is suing the British government. He has evidence that British and American secret services colluded in his extraordinary rendition. اختطفت في مطار تايلاند في العاصمة بانكوك التي كانت في ظروف صحية غاية في الصعوبة حيث كانت حاملا لم تسلم ولم تنجو من التعرض لتعذيب لو سلسلة قالوا لي في ايدي وعلقوني وقعت يومين تقريبا اخر يوم بيجوا يرفوني جابوا السرير حطوني فيه ولفوا علي كلي رجلي سبب تعاون الجهاز الأمن البريطاني والأمريكي لاقيت وتعرضت إلى تعذيب جسدي ونفسي أنا وزوجتي الحامل. Belhaj was tortured in Abu Salim prison for seven years. He was only released when Gaddafi was overthrown. It became quite apparent that we had been involved, not just in the rendition, but also it was plain that we knew that this was going on, that in some cases it looks as though we provided information to the, to the questioners, the torturers, to put to the, uh, to the victims. The Brits cut a deal with the CIA so that they provide the intelligence. The CIA swoops in and black bags him and his heavily pregnant wife and then flies them all the way back to Libya to Gaddafi. And we know this because the former Foreign Secretary and Intelligence Chief, Musa Kusa, who fled from Libya to Qatar as Gaddafi was toppling, 
left a lot of paperwork in his office. And one of the letters was from this Sir Mark Allen, XMI6, current EBP, who was crowing about the success of this British intelligence-led operation to get Bell Hudge, and saying, you know, here he is, have him as a gift. We hope that you'll be pleased with us. I mean, how disgusting is that? Blair's dirty laundry increasingly became the subject of mockery in the media. Yeah, he was basically a gift, Gaddafi. Um, Blair and Straw needed a present for their favourite dictator. You know, maybe they'd get one in return, oil rights or, I don't know, a bung when you leave office. Um, <laughs> so ah, that won't go in. <laughs> extraordinary accusation that, there. Extraordinary, <laughs> suggesting that Mr Blair has made a huge amount of money since leaving a rather bloodstained period when he was in charge. <laughs> yes. I do hope that doesn't get through. Yes. Um, <laughs> Mr Blair chose his words very carefully when asked if he knew what was going on. Your government's been accused of being complicit in the redition of Abdul Hakim Belhaj. Did you have any knowledge of that? No, as I, I say each time I'm asked um, about the Belhaj case, I mean, I don't have any recollection of it at all. But for all his ducking and diving, the dirt was finally beginning to stick to Teflon Tony. Tonight, three former UK ambassadors and major public figures have called for Tony Blair's removal as Middle East envoy. Mired in scandal, Blair finally resigned in 2015, his cloak of respectability torn away. Tony Blair has cancelled a high-profile book signing of his memoirs in London on Wednesday after protesters threw eggs and shoes at him in Dublin. <laughs> Are you going to read it? No, I'm going to burn it. <laughs> I'm not reading this. This is a book written in blood. I was actually just hoping to make a citizen's arrest on Tony Blair. I feel very strongly that the war was illegal. I would have to arrest Tony if I saw him today, and that doesn't make for good interfamily relations. Welcome. This is Hi. quite nice and quiet in here, I would have thought. Aren't you worried that we're going to leap forward and perform some sort of citizen's <laughs> arrest on you? <laughs> no, I'm sort of... <laughs> You're not. safe. It's it not. might happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony Blair, once immensely popular, now lingers at the edge of British politics like a bad smell. In the court of public opinion, he is despised. That's a strong word, but I think that is the situation. With his reputation at rock bottom, Blair made an enemy of the one man who might have helped him limit the damage. The Blair-Murdoch alliance had grown so strong that Tony became godfather to Rupert and Wendy's daughter when she was baptised in the River Jordan. But rumours then spread that Blair had enjoyed a dalliance with Wendy. Murdoch immediately divorced her. This is a disaster for Tony Blair, because whatever the truth of the Blair-Wendy Deng story, the fact is Rupert Murdoch thinks it's true. And these days, it's Blair versus Murdoch. What a shame somebody has to win. The killings of Tony Blair have left the future of the Labour Party and British politics hanging in the balance. But his most damning legacy is in the Middle East. The destruction of Iraq spawned a Frankenstein monster, ISIS. We actually had a military victory against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We basically eradicated it. But we didn't do anything to make sure the politics were sorted out, that the state actually operated fairly to all the peoples that make up Iraq. And because of that, we created a vacuum, which then created ISIS. We are responsible for this. They planted the seeds of terrorism in Iraq. After they occupied Iraq, terrorism spread not only in Iraq, but across the region. ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion, which is why we should generally aim before we shoot. Blair can try and make us believe that without his intervention in Iraq, it would be in a worse state than it is now, which is frankly incredibly difficult to believe. Um, but what I quote John Lennon is, ah, how do you sleep at night? You know, it's that, it's as a person.
The flames of Tony Blair's legacy continue to spread ever further. European capitals are on lockdown for fear of more Paris-style attacks. In Afghanistan, the Taliban are fighting ISIS for power amidst a new sea of poppies. And Britain is at war again. But in truth, Tony Blair is a mere symptom of the West's wider malaise. An economic system run by and for the super rich. The corruption of political parties. Wars fought for profit and resources. And all fueled by a common evil, greed. In the end, Tony Blair succumbed to that evil, becoming a pariah in his own land. For, as Jesus' disciple Mark once told us, what shall it profit a man if he shall gaineth the whole world only to lose his own soul? Feel that? 